song. It's so much fun. All right. So I, before we start, I brought journals. I told you I have a journal problem. So I've got these helpers out here. And if you don't have a journal and you need one, raise your hand. I'm giving you lots, actually. All right. They're going to pass them out. So you need a journal? Put your hand up if you need journals. I don't have that many, but that's okay. Bring more. Next week, bring journals. All right. So uh, one of the things we're doing is homework is SOAP, Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. How many started SOAP this week? It's okay if you didn't. This is not a pass or tail. It's okay. I just want to encourage you this week to do that, which is just from the verses that we're talking about this week, to take one verse and just say, to pick a Scripture, what, what do you observe about it? How can you apply it to your life and a short prayer? That's all it is. And it's just a way for you to get deeper into the content and deeper into what God is doing. We also, talking about dive deeper, we have um, resources for you that um, are, if you want to dive deeper into Ephesians, into history, into the topic about what we're talking about tonight, because I only have a half hour to bring you this amazing concept. If you want more, we have a deep dive um, so we've got lots of different things there for you. And tonight we are beginning to sign up for baptism, for beloved baptisms, for the ministry night that's happening on March 22nd. If you haven't written it down yet, it is March 22nd at 7 p.m. in the worship center. And afterwards, we are going to have a beloved baptism. So if God moves on your heart, now is the time for you to get baptized. We would love to be a part of that moment with you. Um, and we'll do it all together after ministry night. So that is up. Do we have the thing for it? I don't know if we, we have a form. How do they get the form? That's the question. Go to the website. Go to the website and you will see the form. Thebelovedmovement.com thebelovedmovement.com. All right. So tonight, we are in chapter two. And the title of tonight's message is I Am Alive. So for this whole journey uh, together, the question is, who are you? And the question is, who are you in Christ? Who are you to God? Who are you to yourself? What is your identity made of? And last week, we talked about that the beginning of that, the foundation, is that you are who you are. The first thing is in Christ. It's a relationship status change. And when you're in Christ, we have 12 things that we talked about last week. So I want to show those 12 things to get you reminded, or you can get caught up if you weren't here last week. If you are in Christ, if your relationship status has been that you are now in a relationship, a committed, covenant relationship with Christ, that you are blessed, you are chosen, you are adopted, you are redeemed, you are forgiven, you are part of God's plan, you are included, you are marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit, you can know God better, you can know the hope that you're called to, you are God's inheritance and a part of God's holy people, and you can walk in God's power. These are yours when you are in Christ. And so when we move this week to chapter 2, and that was all of chapter 1, the video is up if you want to catch up because it was a long discussion because it was so good. And this week is I am alive. In Christ, I am alive. And as we dive, before we dive into the scripture part of it, it makes me think of the only zombie movie that I like. I don't know about you, but I really, I hate zombie movies. Of all of the horror genre, I'll take a monster any day, but the zombies are the worst. They just creep me out. They're really gross. They're always chasing after people, and they're really bony, and they eat people. It's so gross. And so 90% you know, of the time, I, you know, it's like a zombie movie pass. Too much for me. It's usually dark and scary. There is one of my favorite, my only favorite zombie movie is a movie called Warm Bodies. Has anybody seen it? So I'm not alone. Okay, so this is the, the synopsis of Warm Bodies is this. After an unusual zombie saves a still alive girl from an attack, the two form in a relationship that sets in motion's event that might transform 
the entire lifeless world. And it's this picture, and it's kind of like a Romeo, Juliet. They're young, and they're, you know, they're just adorable. Even the zombie, even though he's dead, like they have, they have um, like levels of dead for these zombies. Like you're, you're dead, but you're just kind of gross and decaying in little parts of you. You're still eating brains, but you still are kind of there. You're like warm. You're still dead. And then the, there's the dead where you're your flesh starts to hang off, and you can see body parts. And then they call them bonies, which is fully zombie. And they're like, all they do is they're just like animals. They're really, really scary. So they're, this one is like, you know, he's dead, but he's still adorable. He's so cute. And he's, he saves this girl instead of eating her. Instead of eating her brains, he saves her, and then he, he tells her to pretend she's a zombie so that he could save her from the other zombies. And he doesn't even know what he's doing. And so he said, and he, he, he goes, come to my plane, which is where they're living right now, in between attacking people. And so he's there, and then he, like, sees her, and he's like, I wonder what she tastes like. Gross. Stop staring at her. You're probably creeping her out. And she's like, why are you staring at me? And he's like, I don't know. And what happens is that they start to spend time together because he's trying to get her out of the zombie zone and take her back home. And as he does, his heart comes back to life. And that love that they start to, that's why it's, it's like a Romeo and Juliet, but like, I don't know which one he is. But, um, but they're young and they're from two different worlds and all this stuff. But he starts to come back to life and he starts to remember, like he starts to pretend he's human first, like, try to remember what it was like to be human. And he fakes it, which is hilarious. But then his heart actually starts to beat, and it gets red, and then it spreads throughout, this life spreads throughout his whole body. And then pretty soon what happens is that he is the antidote. He is the antidote that will um, redeem and will bring to life the zombies that are only mostly dead. <laughs> the bonies, they're unredeemable. <laughs> Um, but these guys, and I don't know why it cracks me up. It just makes me laugh. But I also think that when we think about the story of Jesus, he came into a world of zombies. He came to, into a world, a lifeless world, and he was life. And by coming into that world and inhabiting a body and then dying for our sins, he actually brought God's life into ours so that we could live. And, and we're going to look into what that means in uh, second Ephesians, second Ephesians, let's try this again. Ephesians 2. In Ephesians 2, we're going to start at verse 1. So let's dive into the verse. So it starts with these words. As for you, we're going to start, stop there. As for you. So if you remember in chapter 1, we were talking about God the whole time. We were talking about everything that God did for you, that he chose you, that he adopted you, that he sanctified you, that you are blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And that right before this verse, it says that Jesus is the fullness of God brought into us and he fills you up. And then Paul goes on, he says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit, who is now at work in those who are disobedient. That word dead actually means corpse. It means corpse. That we were corpse, corpses, corpses, is that plural? Corpses. Um, and we were dead in our transi uh, transitions. Wow, I'm having a great time tonight. <laughs> transgressions. And sins. That word transgressions is really interesting because in the Greek, it describes two things. It describes unconscious errors, things you do and you don't even know you're doing it, and those that you do on purpose. And so it covers that and sins. And that sin is that you are missing the mark. There is a target that God created humanity for. And, and they are missing that mark. They are not hitting the target. And those are what those two things mean in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world. And when I think about what, it, what I am alive now because of my relationship with Jesus, but we have to understand why it says that. Because obviously, um, what part of us is dead? Because you and I are walking around. <laughs> and he was talking to people who were living 
but something was dead inside of them. Something wasn't right. Some, there was some disease in there that was eating the life out of them, and they were actually born this way. And it starts all the way back at Genesis. So I want to go back to Genesis for just a quick moment. And we are going to go to Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And this is what it says. It says this. And the Lord God commanded the man, so this is before Eve ever came into the picture. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you shall certainly die. Now, Adam, and I just want to say this, just to clear it, because whenever we preach this, they always blame it on Eve. Like she deceived him. But Eve was not the one that God commanded. Adam was. He blamed her, but it was his, and God didn't blame her. He actually said, you broke this. Why did you do this? But there was a tree of knowledge of good and evil, and when he said, when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Well, we know that Adam and Eve didn't die, and they continued, and that we are from them. Those were the first parents, but what died was their, their spirit died. They spiritually died. They were physically, emotionally, um, mentally alive. But their spirit died because God breathed spirit into them. And when they chose, essentially, because God is the source of all life. And he said, when you take it and you choose, you can choose to trust me. And you can eat of all the trees in the garden. But this one, which is the knowledge of good and evil, which means, essentially, you will decide. If you eat from that tree, it's you deciding what's good and evil. You're going to make, I'm going to be my own God. I'm going to decide what's good. I'm going to decide what's, I'm going to trust myself. When that happens, we are now separated. We are now separated. You're now separated from the source of all life. And as soon as they did that, they ate that fruit. They were separated from God because when he walked in the garden, when you look at it, they hid from him. Why were they afraid from God? He was the source of all life. Well, now they're separated. And this is what Paul talks about in Romans. So we're going to go to Romans real quick just to set the stage. He said, listen, and he's talking about Adam as our first father. He was the first man. And this first man, if you want to go and really read all of it, but he says this, listen, consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. And he says this in this whole um, discourse in Romans, is that Adam, he made this one, he trust, he decided, he, I'm going to trust myself, I'm going to disobey, and I'm cutting myself off spiritually. I don't think he did it on purpose necessarily. But he made the choice. And that choice was a result that after that, everyone that, was, that has been born has been born not connected to God. We are, we are born souls. We are image bearers. God created humanity. It's glorious. But we are not born connected to God because we are not born spiritually alive. But Jesus came, and out of one act of obedience, and what was that one act? It was going to the cross, and it was taking our sins. And because of that means that we have that one righteous act resulted in justification, which means just as if it never happened justification, and life for all people. This is a part of the story. So when Paul says that, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. And essentially, it's like you, you followed. So there are two ways to follow. You are either going to follow the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient, or you're going to follow the spirit of God, which is in you. And in Christ, you are alive to God. In Christ, you are reconciled to God. You are redeemed. He has all of these pictures, and we talked about one of them last week, right? You are adopted into the family of God, which means your old life is gone. And including all the rights and all the mess and all the debt that came with it, and your new life with God has started. You are alive in him that you begin to live fully. Now, baptism is a picture of this transformation. It's a symbol. And it's a symbol that when you say, I'm being baptized, I'm, I, it is an inward, it's an outward symbol of an inward decision that you've already made. 
And that, what that is is that I've surrendered my life to Christ. I'm trusting God, and I want God to be the source of my life. I no longer need to be the source of my life because I know myself well enough, and I'm not good. <laughs> I don't help myself out all that well. And, but that baptism is the picture of dying to the old, the old life, the dead life, the corpse life, and being resurrected with Jesus into new life. That is what baptism is. And I remember I was baptized when I was 12 years old um, at my, by my uncle into the Seventh-day Adventist church. And I remember when I was baptized, um, I was so proud of myself. I was just proud that I did it and because I was going to please God. And when I was 12 years old, God seemed easy to please. I got baptized. And my f- whole family was in the Seventh-day Adventist church. We had a lot of ministers in it. And you just did the right things. And for Seventh-day Adventists, you went to church on Sunday. And you took naps on Saturday. And all the things that you did. And at 12, I saw God as somebody who was pretty easy to please. And so I was, like, proud of myself. And I was like that. It only took me 12, 13, 14, 15. Only three years later did I start to feel like God was not easy to please. And that maybe he was more like he was distant or maybe an absent father. Because it was when I was 15 that when I turned 15, my mom spiraled into this depression suicide season because her mom died when she was 15. So I triggered that season. And she was telling me that God was helping her out. And I really thought, well, he's not around then because this is horrid. (laughs) This is horrible. And about 15 is when I really started to reject God. Then I rejected him. And I said, I don't want anything to do with you because I think you stink. I think you're doing a terrible job. And so I just distanced myself. And then what did I start to do? I started to look around and go, well, what is a different way to live? Because this way didn't fulfill. It's not fulfilling. My mom is empty and depressed, and so are half the people that I know. So I don't know where you are, but what what else is going on out there? Oh, let's see. Well, the world says if you're successful, the world says that if you work really hard, the world says that if you work really hard and you're successful, that you can have power. And if you have money, you can be secure and stable. So I was like, well, there's my goal. I'm going to start doing that. And for a woman, What does that mean? What are we told? We are told if you're smart and you're beautiful and you're willing to do whatever you need to do, you can have it all. And at church, the message that I got was, listen, if you're good and you follow all of God's rules, you can have all of his love. And in the world's message was, if you follow all of our rules and you're good, then you can be successful and stable and you can get the love from people. And then what I discovered is neither one of those was true. And it, I was on a quick road, I was on a very quick road down to living, I was living like a corpse. I was living like, I was trying everything. What about you? What, what are you doing over there? Drug, alcohol, let's see, what is going to fill me up? What is the thing that's going to fill this hole? Because I am empty and I am living already at 17 like a corpse. Looking for love in all the wrong places. And, and feeling like... And, until late in my 17 year is when I walked into a different kind of church. It wasn't like the church that I was raised in. It wasn't the, it was a hi, welcome to church. Here's a list of rules. If you follow these rules, you are good. And if you are good, God will love you. Well, then that means if you're bad, God won't. If you break a rule, which is the Ten Commandments, then you are bad and you will be punished. That's pretty much the same thing the world does. You just got different rules. And this church that I walked in, and they were different because they said they were the ones who told me this good news that God loved me and that he loved me so much that he sent his son to die for me so that he could have a relationship with me for all eternity. And I didn't have to work for it. I didn't have to be good enough for it. I just had to receive it. And when I was 17, 18 years old, I received that good news And it felt like I went from a corpse to a warm body. (laughs) That I went from a dead heart to life. And it was overwhelming. It was overwhelming. But the ways of the world, but here's the thing, is that I had learned up to 17 
the ways of the world. What's the ways of the world? Well, the ways of the world is how the world, how do you learn to live? You're born into this world. You're born into a family. And then sometimes you are born into a church, into a community, into a job. What did you learn from your family? What did you learn was, that was successful? What did you learn that that was good and you'd be loved, but if you were bad, you would be punished? The ways of the world, the patterns of the world are the things that we learn in our childhood and we grow up with the rules of this is how it is. And all of those are the ways of the world are being um, laid out by the spirit, the disobedience. It's by the one, it's the tempter, the devil, the slanderer. He just, and I don't even think he has to work that hard. That's what I decided for me. He's like, the devil's after you. I'm like, no, he's not. He just has to push me over. And I'm like, you're right. It's a total lie. <laughs> or yes, I need to do that. Like our lives are pretty much set up that we know how to live the way of the world. We know how, even for women, when you think about one of the rules that can be is that you have to be beautiful and manipulative to get what you want. That's the way of the world, but that's not the way of God. And in Christ... You are alive to God. Now you are his beloved daughter. You've been adopted into this family. And now this is your new life. We're going to continue. Verse 4 and 5. But because of his great love, say his great love. For us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. My salvation and your salvation is by grace. That is the only way that we are saved. And what I love is it says, he made us alive even when we were dead in our transgressions. And the reason I love that, that specific word, I had never loved the word transgressions before. I think it's too long. We need to have a shorter word for it. But when I looked at the Greek, I loved it because one of the things I was always afraid of is that I was going to do something wrong that I didn't know was wrong and that God wouldn't love me anymore. That I, or I'd forget to confess a sin. We we're big in the Seventh-day Adventist church. You have to confess all this, those sins. Well, what if I don't know I'm sinning? What if, I, what if I'm just walking the pattern in the world? Because that's the only pattern I know. And this relieves all of that. Because his great mercy for us, oh, he made us alive even when we were dead and the things we knew and we didn't knew. And because it's by his grace that you and I are saved. What are we saved from? What are we saved from? We are saved from sin, the power of sin. So when I say I'm alive to God, I'm also dead to sin, the power of it. The power of sin is broken through Jesus and it has no power in your life. Now, I know you're thinking, but then why do I keep sinning? <laughs> why is it that I am made alive in Christ, but I'm still living my old life? And part of that has to do with the patterns and the ways of the world. But I want to present it to you from Dora the Explorer. <laughs> there was an episode of Dora the Explorer, which I religiously watched with my two boys as they were growing up. And it was, she was creating patterns and pathways. And she was creating the pattern and she was going, the pattern is circle, circle, square. And then she would ask somebody to go, now you do it. And you do circle, circle, square. And then she'd say, now it's circle, square, circle. And then she asked, and then they had the little weasel thing that would like steal things that was really wrong or whatever his name was. <laughs> swiper, swiper, no swipey. Yes, I remember. And I remember I was watching that, and I remember um, this phrase dropping in my heart at the time. He says, listen. This is how God talks to me. Listen. <laughs> listen. Uh, the power of sin has been broken into your life, but the pattern remains. It's up to you to change the pattern. The power has been broken. It has no power, but you and I, the process of living life, the process of life is changing those old patterns to new patterns. And they're new patterns, which is God's way of living, God's way of thinking, God's source of life. And he says, I will teach you the new patterns. The power has been broken. The lie is that the power has not been broken. That's what the liar 
comes to you and says, oh, no, you can't stop doing this. Um, Dr. Henry Cloud talks about mind maps, that you and I, from the time we were born, have created mind maps according to what we needed. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of getting what you need and what you want. And how many of you were born in a perfect family? (laughs) Not me. The mind maps that I developed are screwed up. And they are dead and they're transgressions and sins. And that in Christ, and that's why in Romans, Paul says to present yourselves as living that worship. When you worship and when you have a relationship with God, he renews, you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's changing the patterns of how you have thought before. That's changing the old nature that you have, the corpse that you drag around. And... It is that thing that you and I are now alive, and yes, the power of sin is broken. The pattern is what we use God's grace and faith and mercy to change. And so we are alive, and we're becoming more alive every day that you walk with Jesus. It is, it's why it's called everlasting life, eternal life. And that eternal life, you don't have to wait for it. You can have it right now. We are, sent, we are saved from worldly living. We are saved from our old nature, and we are saved from the wrath of God. The wrath of God. And, and you know, looking at, it's, we, I, talk, and I talk about God's love a lot. But there is, a, there is the wrath, that God does have wrath for the disobedient. God does have wrath because he loves us so much that the pain of being separated for us, and that which caused it, he, he wants to destroy. And he first did it by sending Jesus, and he destroyed sin. He destroyed the power of it. But we now have a choice that we can receive God's gift, or we can reject it. But we are saved by his grace and his great mercy. We're saved from his wrath. One of the best pictures of wrath that I've ever heard of that helped me understand this in a way that made sense to my New self, because my old self was like, yeah, I totally thought he was a judge and he was a jerk. I totally knew God was after me, darn it. But in Christ, he's not after me. I am enveloped in his love. And God's not after anybody. He sent his son after everybody. But not everybody will respond. But it is the sin itself, that sin that causes the wrath of God, and this is why. And the picture is the picture of a, a baby in a crib sleeping overnight in the country, and the window is open, and it's a beautiful night, and it's, the stars are out, and there's a gentle breeze coming through that window, and you can see the curtains, and they're flowing, and a snake comes in through that window, a poisonous snake, and that poisonous snake crawls in the crib with the baby and bites it. By morning, that baby is blue, and it is gone. It is gone. It is dead. And the father comes in to find his child gone. And the snake is still there. And he takes the snake and he cuts it into little tiny pieces. That is what the wrath of God is. It is the, the, we have to destroy what separates us. And there is that love hurts because it is love. And this God The God that we serve, the God, the only God, he loves so much that he decided to come down and take the snake on and put himself on a cross and said, I'll take it all, bite me so that I can be the sacrifice. I'll take it for them so they can be free, rich in mercy. So this is my favorite description of grace. It is this. God's Riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, you and I have an open door policy with God. And I I still have a hard time wrapping my brain around God saying, here it is. Here's everything I have. Here is myself for you every day, every minute. I am here for you. I love you. I accept you. I have chosen you. And all the riches of my kingdom are available to you today because you are in Christ. 
Because we do not need to be saved from being bad. God did not, Jesus didn't come to make us good. He came to make us new. He came to make us alive. Second Corinthians says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, say anyone. Anyone. That means the person that you think is impossible for God to change, probably in your house. (laughs) If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come and the old has gone. The new is here. It is that promise that that newness that we live in a new life. But I don't know about you. That because of the patterns, my patterns of religion, my patterns of trying to please and earn God, those patterns, I was, I absolutely can slip into the old way of living, even in my relationship with God, where I start trying to earn it, trying to be a good girl, trying to check my boxes off. Oh, man, I missed my devotion today. I'm going to have to make it up twice tomorrow. I mean, I need it twice tomorrow, but that's not why. (laughs) It's because I'm, then I start to think that God is like going, oh, bad girl. But that's the lie, and that's the old. The new has come. I'm a new creation, and I'm being created new every day because it's a process. I'm really thankful that God is in the long game, that he didn't change me all at 18 when I, stepped, I went to this different church and I heard this different kind of God, and I believed it, and I put my trust in him, and I knew that I was a daughter of God without a shadow of doubt, and I got baptized again. But this time it was my choice, and I wasn't being baptized into a church. I was proclaiming to the world that I am God's. That's what baptism is. I got baptized in a lake in Yucaipa, California, with 700 other people. And I'll never forget it. Because there's nothing like having a reminder of the reality of your life by going under the water and then coming back up again. And it's all, I mean, salvation is all God's work. Sanctification, which is what we call changing into the new, being created new, sanctification, that is all God's work. And God meets you on that way up and you go, oh, hello, new life, new hope, new purposes. Let's keep going. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms with Christ Jesus in order that the coming ages might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. That There's that picture that God, he says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. This one, he gave us his position. He said, I am the firstborn heir of the kingdom of heaven. Here, share it with me and come sit with me. So now I have authority in Jesus. I am a child of God, and Jesus freely has, gives me access to his authority and his power, and he holds nothing back. We are raised with him, and in the coming ages, our lives, and this is what I know, the coming ages is probably us. Because this was in a time when Christianity was a cult. Like the the religion of the day was Zeus and Diana. And they were, it was up in the, he was in Greece. Ephesus is in Greece. And they were worshiping the gods and the Acropolis. He was talking about this living God that was a human and then he died on a cross. That's a terrible way. Why would a God do that? And then he raised to get, he was risen from the dead. And these, these people were starting to grow because God was doing something in them. He was changing them from dead to life. They were in dead religion, and now they're in a life-giving relationship. It was unbelievable. And we are. I think we're a part of the coming ages. Because now, Christianity, Christians, those who follow Christ, we are uncontainable because we are in every country. And it is, it is something that God continues to grow and to grow and to grow. And one of the things that blew my mind was that Greece, who, of course, where all of the gods come from, all of these great stories and the Odyssey and all these stories from, and we know that on a secular level, but Greece now has a cross on their flag because of Christianity. 
It's changed the world. And it's changed our world. All right, let's keep going. It is for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. This was so freeing, but I read it wrong, like I do it all the time when I first start. So I have to study. I have to study a lot. Because I read that you were saved, not by works, but afterwards you're going to have to work at it. I was like, well, I know I was saved by grace. But listen, you were saved by grace. You live by grace. You work by grace. Everything is by grace. John Ortberg said this, saints burn grace more than sinners ever will. It is the fuel that we live on. It is not just saved by grace, but I'm saved, and I'm saved, and I live, and I grow, and I make mistakes, and I fall down, and my heavenly Father picks me up, brushes off my knees, and says, go try again, because I am saved by grace. Are you living a life where you're so afraid that you're going to fall, that you're, he, he's going to reject you because he's going to know the real you? Can I tell you, he knows the real you. He knows every single thing about you. And he sent his son to die for you so that he could give you this gift, which is himself in a relationship where he says, you're my beloved daughter. I love you. I'm proud of you. You have nothing to prove. You have nothing to lose. I am providing all the security. I was looking for security in a way the ways of the world cannot match. Everything, my identity in the world changes according to my job, how much money I make, my skin. <laughs> For women, as we age, the, the, we get all these messages from the world. And what I love is that God's message to women and men who are aging is this. Sure, outwardly, you're wasting away, but inwardly, you're being renewed every single day. That's 2 Corinthians. Is that we have a life in us that now, instead of walking corpses, who are dead inside and dying on the outside. You and I are dying on the outside, but life is being birthed every single day more and more all the way into eternity. So we don't see the world the way it does, and we don't see ourselves the way the world does. And hopefully someday we don't see ourselves the way we see ourselves. We see ourselves the way God does. This is the beloved, and then continue, it's good news, it's good news. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Not only, God says, I've saved you by grace, and I love that because one of the, mes one of the versions says, that I think it's the NLT, for we are God's masterpiece. Another version says we are his poem. It is this picture that God has been waiting for you and I to come into his arms so that you can, with him, do what he already planned for you to do. He's like, I have things for you to do with me. I, I, we are God's handiwork. We are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Good works don't save you. Good works don't make God love you more. But we are created to do good which God prepared in advance, do you know that God has divine appointments set up for you tomorrow? God has appointments for you to fulfill. He has you gifts that he wants to empower you to use, and it is that we do good works with him. I love, I think it's the message version, yeah. I love the message version. It says it this way. It says, he creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does. The work he has gotten ready for us to do and man, we better be doing it with him. Talk about a new way to live. I guarantee that God knows where you are, who you are, what kind of work that you're doing now, and the work that he's already prepared you for. And the adventure of God is he wastes nothing. He wastes nothing. And he has a plan and a purpose for us to work with him as his daughters. Who are you? Who are you? The answer is in Christ, I am alive, I am saved by grace, I am raised up with Christ, I am living in the gift of God. Are you living in the gift of God or are you living in the weight of the world? Are you living with the weight of worry? Is that killing your spirit? Or are you being fed by the truth of God? I am God's handiwork. Go ahead, say it to the person next to you. I'm, God, I'm God's handiwork. Now turn to the next person and say, he did a good job. 
Because he did. And the last one is, I am created to work with God. I am a beloved daughter of God. This is who I am in Christ. And I am alive. My prayer is that if you are a walking corpse today, if you're the walking dead, if you came in the walking dead, (laughs) you will leave alive in Christ. And that for those of you who are mired down with religion and old patterns, and you're carrying around corpses from the past that don't belong in your life anymore, that tonight you will have a moment where you can realize that the devil is a liar and you are alive in Christ. Throw them off. Jesus already took it on the cross. You don't have to carry it anymore. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for your words and your truth and the reality of who you are. I thank you, Lord, that it is not my words that transfer the power of this concept, but it's your presence. I pray as they go into their table discussion time that you will um, infuse it with the truth. And as they journey wherever they are with you, that you'll just take them, help them to take that next step. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.